All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening or good night, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. It's only 12.55 here in Boston, so we're not quite starting just yet. But if you're showing up early, I'm going to take you on a little behind the scenes tour of our exhibition as a prize for being an early bird to our live feed today. We'll get the proper talk started in about five minutes at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, but before then, I thought I'd share some objects that didn't make it into our exhibition. Uh, this is a little background to the, uh, the planning of the exhibition, some of the stuff that got left on the cutting room floor. And then at one o'clock, we'll start our talk and we'll bring in our special guest for today, Maggie Owens. Um, so, like I said, I'm going to show an object that didn't make it into our exhibition as part of this uh, little behind the scenes look. And here we go. This is uh, actually one of my favorite maps in the collections. It's just beautifully rendered 1940s map of Great Britain showing its natural and industrial resources, as you can see in the title of this map. And what's interesting about this map is it seems to be a pretty straightforward portrayal of uh, Britain's economic geography in the 40s. It's got icons symbolizing everything from forests to fisheries to industrial activity. Uh, but if you look in the corner to who produced this map, it was produced by the British government, uh, the British Information Service, an agency of the British government. Fairly straightforward, it's very common for national governments to produce maps like these, um, showing off their industrial power. But the address for the British Information Service on Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. So what was the British government doing producing a map like this in New York City in the 40s? Well, the British Information Service was a propaganda arm of the British government during World War II, uh, 1940s. Uh, obviously, the United States is allied with Britain uh, fighting the Second World War. And uh, agencies like the British Information Service would have been used to uh, kind of promote a, a, a friendly face, a, uh, the, the face of an important ally to the Americans. Um, they spoke not only to Americans, uh, but uh, all around the world outside of uh, Britain proper. So this is an interesting piece. We don't know exactly how it got to the library, but it's very possible that a, a map like this would have been deposited in major public libraries like the BPL. Uh, and again, there's, uh, it's, it's a, a it's just a beautiful combination of kind of artistic license and then an argument. So, you know, it's easy to look at this map, the colors and the shading and the iconography are really gorgeous. Um, some of the symbols that they've used are really um, quite beautifully rendered, sugar beets, fruits, vegetables, milk. Uh, you see this kind of beautiful, uh, uh, economically rich island. And of course, what the British Information Service wanted you to think was, well, we'll put our resources towards defending it in the war. Uh, we would have shown this map uh, in our section on uh, warfare, but we left it out for a couple of reasons. You'll see we have some other objects that tell kind of a similar story. Uh, and this map is also enormous. It barely fits in uh, some of the physical space of our, uh, where we show maps like this in the library. Uh, and so we left it out for a number of reasons. But for those of you who uh, tuned in early today, you got to have a sneak peek at it. Uh, all of these maps are in our digital collections. So uh, if you navigate to our website and browse our digital collections, you can find this map as well by searching for Great Britain, her natural and industrial resources. If you're just tuning in, uh, you can see the banner down here. We were just giving a behind the scenes look at the exhibition with an object that didn't make it into the show. But I think it is just about one o'clock, at which point we will get started uh, with today's episode of Angles on Bending Lines. Um, if you haven't seen it already, our digital exhibition is available at leventhalmap.org slash bending dash lines. Uh, encourage you to take a look and subscribe to our future shows uh, and visit the online exhibition itself. So that concludes our pre uh, 
pre-discussion tour. I'm going to do one of those every week for those of you who are enterprising enough to show up five minutes early to the talk. Uh, but now that it is one o'clock here in Boston and whatever o'clock in whatever time zone you're tuning in from, we're going to get started with our first episode of Angles on Bending Lines. I'm Garrett Dash Nelson. I'm the Curator of Maps and Director of Geographic Scholarship at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And we are so excited that it's May 27th because May 27th is the opening day for our new show, Bending Lines, Maps, and Data from Distortion to Deception. In Bending Lines, we're taking a look at a big question. How are truth and belief shaped by maps and other forms of data? Now, some maps are obviously trying to distort the truth, make an argument, or maybe sell you something. And we're showing some of our most extraordinary maps like these in the exhibition. Uh, whether that's a giant octopus in the place of Russia, or a map that's advertising cheap land for sale in the suburbs of Boston, these kinds of maps are clearly playing fast and loose with persuasion and emotion. But one of the key arguments that we're making in Bending Lines is that all forms of visual evidence make arguments in some way or another. Every map has to simplify the world, and every map has to make choices about how to represent the complexity of reality. Even a scientific looking map produced from a sophisticated data source will still bear the traces of the creator's assumptions, biases, and ways of understanding the world. Now on Earth 2, we would be welcoming you right now to our map gallery in the Boston Public Library's Central Branch in Copley Square to see the objects from Bending Lines in person. But instead, today is marking the launch of our digital first version of Bending Lines. It's really much more than just a collection of objects online. Uh, we've created an entire immersive web publication with essays, references, citations, and most excitingly, interactive content that can that allows you to explore the maps, zoom in on them, and wander through the exhibition, spending much more time on it than you probably ever would able be able to do if you had come to visit us at the library. And some of these maps, the image resolution is so good, you can get right down to see the tears in the paper, uh, which of course is hard to do when it's behind a glass case. So there are ways in which visiting the uh, digital exhibition is even more exciting than coming to see it in person. You'll see a link right below me, leventhalmap.org slash bending dash lines. That will take you to the online exhibition. Also looks great on a cell phone. So if you're bored uh, and scrolling away on your phone, as so many of us do these days, uh, that's a great way to look at it as well. We will be opening bending lines at some point in the future when the library is again ready to welcome visitors that we don't yet know when that will be. So keep track of us on the web and on social media and we'll share more information about when we know uh, when we might be able to say hello to you and to see some of these objects uh, in paper uh, in reality. Now, I want to welcome a really special guest who's going to be talking with us today about the maps that she created for this exhibition. Maggie, I'm going to bring you into the stream. Yeah. Hi, Maggie. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Right. Yeah, it's great to have you here. All right, so sharing the screen space with me now is Maggie Owens. Uh, Maggie's a planner and analyst with the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. And at the Parks Department, Maggie works to place issues of equity and storytelling front and center through collaboration, a critical and judicious use of data, and accessible visualizations. She's committed to exploring new ways of producing community-based illustrations that strengthen civil discourse and facilitate participation in the planning of Boston's park system. And we're so glad that she's joining us here today for our first chat about the exhibition. Maggie, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at the Parks Department? Sure. Um, I've been a planner and principal research analyst for a little over a year now, and I get to be a part of really cool mapping projects like the tree canopy change analysis and the parcel priority plan, where the public tells us where they'd like to see new open space. But uh, it's been an interesting road getting here, having started out in biology and moving to ecology and land protection, and finally sustainable urban design, planning in the parks department, uh, gives me an opportunity to understand the interplay between identity and knowledge building uh, and how that affects how we think of civic spaces and what we want them to look like. Because um, 
whether we realize it or not, we're continuously reaffirming or reconfiguring our understanding of the world and our place in that world. And I'm curious about how our data diet affects this intensely personal process and um, that carries with it societal implications. So I hope that comes through in the pieces we'll be covering. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. Um, you're in some ways a perfect person to talk about the project that you participated in. And that project is part of the exhibition called Same Data, Different Stories. And what we did was we wanted to show that data by itself never gives us an answer on its own. It's very tempting to say, oh, you can look at the numbers and the facts stand for themselves. But in reality, data always needs people to interpret it, to make choices about what's important and what's not important. And then when that data gets rendered onto a map to make choices about what it looks like and what we're telling. Um, what we did was we took a, a curated data set of some variables about the state of Massachusetts. I'll give you a little preview of that here. Uh, da -da -da -da. How can I get us all three in here at the same time? There, all, all of us are here at once. Um, we took a data set that looked like this and we gave it to half a dozen cartographers, some work in journalism, some work in public service like Maggie. Uh, and we didn't tell them what we wanted to get out of this data. We gave them some metadata like you see here. Um, we described the relationship of the data layers to one another. And we asked our cartographers to give us two competing interpretations of this data. So to look at the data set and tell two stories that conflicted with one another. The goal of that is to show that the data on its own can't dictate the conclusions that we draw. But then instead it's the cartographer's role and the data analyst's role and the public's role to make uh, informed decisions about what they're seeing. So Maggie, do you want to tell us a little bit about the maps that you created out of our data set and how you went about exploring it? Sure. Um, the, so I ended up going with hazardous food sites and that was a lot of fun because uh, the conflict that often arises is between how do we care, how do we see our role in caring for the environment and whose responsibility is it? And there can be a lot of polarizing opinions there. So that means that there's a lot of opportunity for uh, manipulation. And uh, the hazardous beliefs, the first map, Rethinking Hazardous Beliefs, kind of plays on one side of the coin where uh, people are, um, oh yes. Just brought it up so we can take a look at the first map. Yeah, in the first map here, hotbeds of contamination, I calculated the number of sites falling within town boundaries of hazardous sites um, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection tracks where the release of oil or hazardous waste may limit the ways in which a property is used. And they can be permanent or temporary, and a lot of the hazards are going to be from some form of petroleum product. And um, the calculating the sites within town boundaries and the map coloring is based on that. I highlighted the top nine most populous towns in Massachusetts with their counts so that their names become more closely associated with the title that they are somehow hotbeds of contamination, they are blaming, they are responsible for the generation of hazardous conditions. And then uh, there is a very real fact that like in the captions, it's a real piece of data that Boston has 479 sites according to the data set, and that cities do indeed typically have more hazardous waste sites. But the operative word there is generates. Do we solely hold the individual property owner or town responsible? Is it worth it to also examine the broader forces at play? And are there cultural systems we participate in that increase the likelihood that an individual or company will have a release site like this? And so in the next map, in rethinking hazardous beliefs, I kind of flipped the calculation. Instead of just count, I did hazards per capita and per capita, immediately brings in a second variable, hazards and population. So from this begins to articulate a belief that the site, the hazardous site should not be evaluated in isolation, that there are broader forces, time contamination to population, not just an individual responsibility and in that um, it's these towns and big cities that are just at fault. 
And so I go on to label there some of the smaller towns that actually have quite high per capita rates of contamination of these contaminated sites. Uh, and really neither map holds of one answer. It's just about asking yourself, when I look at map, is it telling me, uh, like what's the limit of what it can tell me? And what is it, what may be the undertones? Because when we talk about uh, personal responsibility and blame, like that can happen with just a simple count and then switching it to, well, these things don't happen in isolation. We can start to highlight um, kind of latent narratives that happen. So cities, why are we thinking that's, why is it so easy to digest the fact that, oh yeah, cities are more dirty and dangerous and of course, well, there's a lot of kind of a history of latent racism in that, that thinking in the second map I included an image so that uh, that becomes a little more evident that we have to think about the systems that play and uh, that it's not always as simple as we, we would like to be. I love these maps so much because they combine so many interesting facets of cartography, everything from the way that you approach the data uh, to some of the choices around words and images and styling that you used. Um, so of course, these are choropleth maps um, for our viewers who don't know. Uh, a choropleth map is a type of map which uses colors or shaded areas um, to show the amount of something in an area, right? And an advantage of a choropleth map is we tend to recognize those shapes, right? So for those of us in Massachusetts, Boston is a fairly recognizable shape and we know where it is. Um, but a choropleth map also makes it really uh, easy to hide some of the underlying data patterns, right? Because it's coloring in areas, if the data doesn't relate to areas, then it may be misleading insofar as large areas will look more important than small areas. Uh, even if, for instance, a lot of people live in a small area and very few people live in a large area. So you've used the technique of a choropleth map, which is so recognizable. Um, we talk in the exhibition how choropleth maps seem very, uh, you kind of understand them at first sight because they're everywhere. We see them in the media, we see them in scientific publications, we see them in textbooks. We know, we think we know what choropleth maps are. And it's precisely in that moment where we think we know what we're looking at that we sometimes forget to take a skeptical stance, right? So you've used these very straightforward maps, right? Like a viewer could look at this and between the choropleth technique and the titles, it's easy to make a really snap judgment, right? So. Then this first map, I'm looking at it. I can see very clearly the way that you've outlined in blue Massachusetts' largest cities. I can immediately pick up a pattern where the, the most populous cities are also the ones that have uh, the most toxic waste sites. And then I look at the title, the toxicity of our cities, hotbeds of contamination, and I've I've got a narrative there, right? And it's a narrative, like you said, that fits in to our pre-existing stereotypes. Cities are dirty, cities are sites of pollution, um, cities are places that we'd rather not be uh, if we wanted to uh, keep away from toxic waste. And in the second map, you flip that even though you've kept so much of the same visual register, right? It's still a choropleth map. You're still using many of the same colors, but you've done a process which of course we call normalization, right? taken the data and you've divided by population. So then instead of looking at uh, the number of people, uh, the number of total uh, sites that are in each of these towns, we're looking at the, the sites per capita. And suddenly it's a t completely different pattern, right? We see that there are some large cities uh, in the Boston metro area that do have uh, high ratios of sites per capita. Um, but also a lot of places in Western Massachusetts where our cultural associations are more likely to make us think of the pastoral, scenic landscapes, recreational tourism sites. Uh, and suddenly we're asking a different question about where, uh, where are the dirtiest places in Massachusetts? And, and you've had this brilliant title here, Rethinking Hazardous Beliefs, Challenging Perceptions of the Dirty City. I love how you talked about even bringing in this image here, which, you know, I think we tend not to think of images as um, intimately connected to the work of cartography, but of course they're also framing, li literally framing on the outside of this map, but also conceptually framing what the takeaways might be. Um, can you tell us more about, uh, as you started to just look into the data set, how you started thinking about this and how it relates to your work uh, in city planning and, and working for par the Parks Department in Boston? 
Yeah, um, I think, well, first of all, I, I, I wanna preface it with kind of how to narrow down the data sets that you provided um, to find out what narrative then I could, I could manipulate. Um, knowing that the goal was to bend, or bend truth or create different interpretations, I kind of began with the easiest approach, uh, making all the mistakes I could think of. Uh, layering over everything, could I draw bad correlations? And then, um, then I also did it from a predatory perspective. How could I exploit people's unfamiliarity with cartography or the subject matter? And um, because people are often not starved necessarily for data on a situation, but wisdom. And we face that a lot in the planning profession when there's often no good solution, um, we call them wicked problems. It's just a solution you're more willing to work with than others. And I kind of like how Shoshana Zuboff put it, um, she researches data privacy. Search used to mean a sort of existential struggle, a journey through life where we discover our identity and our meaning. And there were no answers. You couldn't just a few clicks search for the answer. And we face that in planning, people want an answer. And instead, how do we guide a conversation? And uh, hazardous waste sites are emblematic of how we perceive both our role in the earth system and our responsibility. And so pollution, um, our pollution and responsibility are really relevant to me as a parks planner. And it can be polarizing subjects. And so it's all about how do you create a visualization that doesn't immediately pull upon some of those sensitive spots and move us past uh, towards a more productive conversation. Yeah, that's, that's so great. And we think a lot in the exhibition about asking this question of maps, what was the cartographer's purpose and motivation? Uh, as an informed viewer of maps, those are some of the questions we have to ask, right? Rather than thinking about, is this map factually accurate or is it factually inaccurate? Moving away from a strict division of cartography into true and false and thinking instead about maps as being politically, socially, culturally situated as objects of communication that invite us to ask questions. What was this person trying to do? Was Maggie trying to lie to us? Was Maggie trying to deceive us? Was Maggie working for a uh, toxic remediation uh, consulting firm or somebody else that might have a financial interest in uh, portraying this facial distribution of toxicity in Massachusetts in one way or another? Um, you know, you've given us some clues here in in the uh, visual uh, layout of the of the map itself, right? You've shown your data sources. Um, you've given us some information about where it came from. Um, interestingly, you don't have your own name, and of course, this wasn't produced for a business or an institution, so there's no logos on it. But those are other ways for us to to think about, you know, why was this map produced? What was the person producing this map trying to convince us of? And Thinking about that question doesn't always mean that they were trying to convince us of something nefarious. It could be that they were trying to rally us for a social cause, right? It could be that they were trying to show us um, hidden forms of injustice that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. So we really are trying to think in bending lines, not just as bending is something that's always manipulative and bad and deceitful, uh, but as a process that's inherent in uh, visualizing data and communicating uh, with the world in, in ways that can be very symbolic and very representational. Um, so it's, it's so interesting the way that you've taken into account not only kind of our prompts of tell us some some tricky stories, but also your own work with um, kind of challenging people's latent beliefs about the relationship between environmental degradation and urbanism, and of course the associations between urbanity um, and different types of cultural and demographic diversity. One of the things that I was curious about um, uh, kind of asking you is there's a way in which, you know, which which of these two maps would we say is more accurate? On the one hand, this one um, is not normalized. It's got the, you know, it, it makes it look like the cities are the most dirty. This one shows us a more complicated picture where some small towns actually have very high uh, toxic um, uh, numbers of toxic waste sites per capita. But when we think about toxic waste sites, you know, depending on what they are, they can pollute and poison as many people. It's not something that's divided, necessarily needs to be divided by capita, right? Like if we were talking about number of library books, we might want to say per capita because only one person can hold a library book at a time. Whereas a pile of toxic sludge could 
poison five people or 500 people or 10,000 people, uh, depending on how many people live near it. So there's a way in which we could take this same unnormalized data and actually tell a kind of environmental justice story about it to say, if we had brought in information about minority populations or poverty um, or lack of access to institutional resources to say that um, these toxic sites tend to be spatially correlated with some of our society's most vulnerable people. Um, and that actually it's normalization by population might not be the, the, the way to look at it. Um, how would you, how would you think about some of those questions? Yeah. Um, I think you outlined the challenge of planning really well and also data management, a big part of my role. I'm the first, uh, research analyst for the department. And a lot of my job is to look through old data and also develop new data sets and figure out what are the most appropriate uses for those? What are the most ethical uses of those? Mm -hmm. And where can we uh, make sure that our data is more equitable? Are we considering people of different ages, gender, race, et cetera? And so um, I would just say, one thing I always tell people is you have to have a specific question. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you're not going to get a straight answer out of me. Is this the best way or is this the best way? It's what is your question and what is your intent? Because uh, usually question, you have to come up, you have to have an intent to come up with a question. So you have to have some sort of value or priority to decide what is worth addressing. And so that affects how we should structure the data collection. And mm -hmm. that's why it is never pure. It doesn't, you can't just pluck a, this a piece of data untouched by humans out of the ether and be like, aha, totally independent. Yeah. So um, I would say just what you said, it's not, uh, it really depends on what you're trying to talk about, what is your value and, and what outcome are you looking for? Yep. And that search for answers, which of course we, we, you know, is so kind of tempting, right? To say that, wow, I, you know, I can see the answer on this map. I sometimes like to use the term data sublime. And what I mean by that, that in, in the 19th century, the term sublime was uh, referred to people who go to mountains and chasms and waterfalls, and they felt like they could see God in those kind of dramatic landscapes. And there's a way in which we kind of like see the truth in, especially in big data sets, right? I've worked with um, some cartography like this myself. And it's striking, even as a cartographer, when you say, well, you know, let's be careful about what's being shown here. Let's be cautious about our conclusions. Let's think about some of the, um, you know, complexities or absences in this data. When people see, you know, millions of points of data or all of this information that's been called from these quote unquote scientific sources, it's really easy to get lulled into a sense of almost sublime faith, right? Like as if you're seeing the underlying truth of our world in a way that you couldn't have seen before. And cartography is so powerful because it can pull out some of these invisible hidden truths, right? It's, it's hard to see the spatial phenomena of environmental justice, for instance, without cartography and with, without data. Uh, but it's also very, uh, um, it's kind of lulls us into a false sense of knowledge, a false sense of mastery over the world uh, by looking at a map and thinking that we understand it all. Um, I wanted to look at a couple of other objects that are in the collection that I think uh, kind of echo off, off of some of the work that you did in these two excellent maps. Um, for anybody who didn't hear the very beginning of the talk, uh, our exhibition, uh, our digital exhibition is online at leventhalmap.org slash bending hyphen lines, where you can see Maggie's excellent maps. Uh, on, uh, five other sets of same data, different stories maps uh, produced by other cartographers from other walks of life, uh, all of which tell really interesting competing stories from the very same data set that we gave to Maggie. Uh, and then uh, an, all of the many other objects which are in this exhibition from our collections at the Leventhal Map and Education Center, uh, as well as partner collections. So one of the ones that I wanted to look at, and then Maggie, let's come back to some of these other images that you sent me. Um, one of the other maps in the collection is this one uh, from 1920, um, from the Irish nationalist movement. This map was published as uh, the British government was um, pa about to pass uh, a home rule law for Ireland as the Irish increasingly demanded uh, independence. Um, and in the 1920, uh, uh, home Rule Bill, the British government proposed partitioning Ireland into Northern Ireland and uh, Southern Ireland. Uh, of course, we're familiar with those partitions today. Um, 
But this map, which was produced by Irish nationalists, and I realized I didn't actually have the map here for you all to look at, so you didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Here's the map. Uh, in this map, which was produced by Irish nationalists, they were, they were trying to prove, again, using a Choropleth map, kind of similar to the visual device that you chose, Maggie, um, to prove that the proposed Northern Ireland was not as homogeneously Catholic as the British government was making it out. So these borders show the lines of the proposed Northern Ireland. And then we have a kind of mini Choropleth map here. So here's the legend. The double hashes have large Protestant minorities. The, the horizontal hashes are narrow Protestant majorities. And this bright fiery red is nationalist majorities. So we are categorizing the counties of Ireland in a Choropleth map, but they've made very uh, careful choices about how to symbolize those categorizations, right? Uh, these red counties that are included in Northern Ireland, but that actually have Catholic minorities or Catholic majorities. And of course, the Catholics were strongly nationalist, um, both at the time and in the present. So this, this seems to be a kind of data map, uh, and it is. Here are the statistics um, according to the, the um, Census of Ireland at the time. We've got these tables of data seemingly proving that the proposed division of the country into northern and southern halves is violating um, this this kind of like natural demographic pattern of Ireland. Um, so, what do you think about the the kind of categorization of of this Choropleth map? Is that is this a technique that you, that you would ever use in a in a good data map, Maggie? <laughs> um, probably not. Uh, power dynamics are already really hard to pluck out some data, who are we talking about? Like, um, I think it was Caroline Criado Perez, her data bias, uh, Invisible Women and Data Bias. And it was just a really enlightening about how the ways in which we can uh, silence others and implications for that. And this is an example of just, uh, it's very, they're very upfront about their intentions, uh, but because as a public servant, I would hesitate to so heavily advocate for a single identity like that, but um, it's effective. And I think that those are sometimes the maps that we're responding to in the course of our planning work and trying to provide a more nuanced understanding, uh, a more collective discourse. Definitely. And what's interesting about this map and then the one that we'll look at next is it is deceptive in a certain way, and it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't pull any punches. I mean, the title talks about the great betrayal. Um, there's text talking about the homogenous humbug and uh, very political narrative surrounding it. And, you know, no kind of professional cartographer would choose to categorize a Choropleth map in this way. It's a kind of a, a deliberately um, pointed uh look at, at Ireland's population. But of course, the Irish nationalists were the underdog in this scenario. You know, they were the imperial subjects of the British Empire. Uh, the people who published this map were desperately trying to make a case against uh, their fates kind of being controlled by uh, Parliament in London. Um, so one of the things that we've thought about in this show is that, you know, bending the lines can look very different depending in whose hands it's taking place, right? If a uh, you know, a powerful agency, a state, a national government is bending the lines in order to trick its own citizens. That looks very different from, let's say, an activist group trying to make the case in a map for uh, a, a social movement um, or an argument about social justice. Um, so we can bend lines in many different ways and for many different reasons. Uh, it's and it's the responsibility of the viewer not to decide are the lines bent or not, but who's bending them and why are they bending them? The next map is kind of similar. It's a much more contemporary. We're jumping to the 20th century now. This is a map produced by an anti-nuclear campaign. Uh, it's looking at the routes used to transport uh, nuclear material around the United States. Uh, it's fairly straightforward in that there are uh, sites of um, that were producing nuclear materials uh, and uh, kind of straightforward lines connecting them, showing uh, where these materials were shipped. Uh, but not accidentally, those lines are very generously spaced out. So if you take a look here at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, um, to the Savannah River plant, uh, there's almost a dozen lines connecting these two. 
in reality, it was probably just one highway route that the that material would have taken between these two sites. But the way it looks is as if there's this huge hundred mile wide swath of uh, you know nuclear transportation that's basically covering the entire state of South Carolina. And the same is true as we go across the United States. Um, the, the the data designers here have taken some creative liberties to you know. To, to make these routes look like they really cover a lot of the United States. And so similarly, you know, it's deceptive in one sense, but it's deceptive in order to argue a point against the kind of dominant power uh, of, uh, you know, who was making and producing nuclear weapons and for what purposes. The, the line work is interesting because that's a huge uh, challenge for us the need for intent to be very clear and visually accessible. So um, often you'll see in maps, green spaces have like an extra large line around it or they're just really vibrantly green. And sometimes it can make like there's more open space than there is, but at the same time, would people be able to understand what's there? And it's always a measure of what am I trading off for visibility and potential misinterpretation and um, and a line like that, you know, we wouldn't be able to read that map if it was a single line, even a single thick line. And so um, whether or not it's deception even becomes a question. Yeah, that's a great point. We talk a little bit in the exhibition how in some sense, the only map that's not distorting at all is just the whole world itself, right? As soon as you start to reduce something down onto a visualization, whether it's a map or a scatter plot or an infographic, we've got to simplify because simplifying allows us to see some things and hide others. But that process of simplification will always leave something out and thinking about what it leaves out uh, is really important. So it could be that leaving something out allows us to see uh, a, a pattern or a phenomenon that we really want people to see and that would be obscured in the messy, complex reality of the real world. Um, but sometimes it means we're hiding something from people that we don't want them to see uh, and that we're you know, using our cartographer's tricks uh, to tell a story that's not uh, completely, um, completely forthcoming about, uh, about reality. So I want to ask you a question, you know, you've alluded to this before, but you know, you work for the, the parks department uh, in the city here, um, you make maps. Uh, so how do you think of your own work as kind of embedded in the social and community context of Boston parks? Parks are a community asset. Cartography for better or for worse remains still a kind of expert technical skill. Uh, we do a lot of work at the MAP Center with our education programs and our exhibitions and our public instruction to try to bring the cart power of cartography to the citizens of Boston. But oftentimes it's still, you know, it needs to go up to somebody who knows GIS, somebody who's professionally trained the way that you are. So how does the work that you do, which is, um, you know, technically skilled, um, also aesthetically very, uh, very beautiful, how does that connect with, with your work in a city department that's very uh, kind of on the ground and connected to people's lives? Exactly. Um, I will say that it is a challenge and it's something that I'm still figuring out. Uh, it is... I think one of the first things that maybe cartographers forget is that not everyone is even comfortable with the form, the image, and that it already, by putting data into that type of visualization and selecting against a number of people who may not be familiar with that, or it may not be able to resonate with them because we are, you know, I chose the way to represent the map I did uh, because those are culturally familiar in a lot of ways, at least culturally familiar in the way I operate. And so working um, for the city, and this is the first time I've worked for a major city in such a diverse population, it is understanding, okay, yes, some parts of the map making process probably need to be in my hands, but how much of it can be put in citizens' hands? And whether that's the actual art of producing the map or making it more comfortable to provide input on them. And those are processes that I'm trying to figure out. And for the parcel priority plan, I started posting uh, the weekly results of the survey so that people could see how things change and um, not just become acquainted with maps. 
And that's one step is be, becoming acquainted and not, not making them too scary. And uh, I think one avenue, and I, I learned a lot about it at Leventhal lecture uh, with Margaret Pierce, uh, reading the cartographies of dispossession. Mm -hmm. Reading, uh, she made a great point that a lot of uh, modern American maps don't include any people or historical references. Mm -hmm. And that is a very specific cultural phenomenon here. And I hadn't really thought of that. And the ways in which that could really enrich our planning conversations about how the park system has come to be, how people feel about that and where they want to see it. Can I start to incorporate those more humanistic elements to, to rather than just having like a chloropleth map or an outline? And um, I hope that that makes it feel more like a community owns it, that their story is truly incorporated and it's not depersonalized. And um, yeah, it's a work yeah. of progress. I love that. We have a section in the exhibition called Mapping Ourselves, where we talk about this kind of people-centric view of cartography, rather than treating the map as this thing that comes down from on high and is, you know, this kind of static, fixed scientific diagram, thinking about uh, maps as something that people can produce and that they can speak back to. You know, we all know how words can be used both by those on high to persuade and, and you know, promote political platforms. But we know that words also are hugely powerful in the hands of ordinary people. You know, that's how we speak up and, you know, forge community power. And I kind of like to think of maps as the same way. We know that maps can be produced in really hegemonic ways. We know that maps can um, tell and reinforce dominant narratives, but we also like to think um, with hard work and um, by putting uh, kind of people's interests first, that we can also uh, reach a form of cartography that that does center ordinary people in a different way and that allows it to be more of a two-way or a many-way conversation um, rather than just a thing that you look at and you think, wow, I saw the truth, I saw the facts. Um, yeah, and sometimes it's you know, you have that aspect of visualization and creating the map and then instances where I'm just going to be creating a map and putting it online, like I'm developing a new way of tracking park assets. So can you find the nearest accessible playground, NBA accessible or inclusively designed playground near you? And that form of empowerment too, to be able to participate in society to the fullest extent by able to see the information. Uh, and yeah, sometimes those are like the fairly rapid productions and then um, where visualization, the visualization narrative maybe isn't such a hindrance, but uh, is a good tool to help people, yeah, yeah, fully participate in civic life. Yeah. Did you want to look at some of these other uh, images that you sent me, Maggie? Uh, maybe this map of New Orleans? Yes, the New Orleans. Yes, let's do that one. Great. Here it is. The green dot plan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure well, a lot us, of people have heard about this one. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, as we all know, New Orleans suffered a lot of damage after Hurricane Katrina. And the question became, how do we rebuild? Do we repeat the mistakes of history past? And so through a somewhat problematic planning process, they came up with this map for a way to create a park system in areas that had previously flooded. And some of the issues that come from this is the people that lived in those areas because they were flooded, um, weren't allowed back in the neighborhood and could not participate in this planning process. Adding insult to injury, the insensitivity of the symbology of placing a circle over your neighborhood is pretty abrasive. And, um, I just, I, I find it unfortunate that that happened and uh, a great learning lesson about uh, recreating past issues, the, re the ways in which racial segregation happened and uh, why certain people were more affected than others. And then adding insult to injury by then when something bad happened because they were at higher risk, um, just paving over it and doing it in a graphically uh, really, terrible way, which is in some ways a blessing because it made it easier for a societal conversation to happen to see green dots placed over people's lives. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of things going on there. 
Yeah. And, you know, this, this appearing in uh, a newspaper as well, um, we talk in the show about the, the role of these kind of ephemeral maps, right? Maps aren't always produced, you know, over the course of many months by a trained academic cartographer and appearing in a textbook or an atlas. A lot of the maps that we see are like this one in the news. They're in, you know, we see them in a newspaper or a magazine, or especially today, we see them on social media. They come across Twitter or they flash across a news screen. And so how do we evaluate those maps that are oftentimes, um, you know, produced for a very rapid purpose and, 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 as, as we see here, can really have the effect of, of telling people that their lives are being played with in ways that um, they feel like they, they may have no voice whatsoever. We've got an interactive in the, in the digital exhibition called Maps in the Media, Do You Trust This Map? And we've been curating a live feed of maps that we find on Twitter and in the news. Uh, and you tell us, do you trust them or not? Look at you can uh, kind of click through a series of maps and say, does this map seem trustworthy or are you, or are you skeptical of it? Uh, and then see what others have, have said about the same maps. And certainly a map like this one, interesting because maybe, uh, you know, a, a white resident from the high ground in New Orleans would say, oh yeah, this map seems great. Seems like it makes total sense. So our positionality as map readers also really uh, affects um, what we're seeing here uh, and, and how we're able to interpret it. So I was trying to see a map through somebody else's eyes. We can never truly, um, you know, take on the situatedness of somebody else, but having the kind of um, curiosity and the humbleness to imagine what a map might look like through somebody else's eyes is a really important role for cartographers and for readers of maps as well. So we're reaching uh, our 45 minute mark. Maggie, I'm gonna bring in uh, a guest really quickly um, and then we'll bring you back. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A with Maggie, uh, which we're crossing our fingers will work. We've never done one of these before, but I think I am seeing a live feed of comments from uh, YouTube and Facebook for those, everybody who's tuned in live. Should also mention that this uh, video will be recorded um, and, and hosted on YouTube uh, as well as in the digital exhibition so that people can access it afterwards. So in uh, about a minute or two, we'll be back to Maggie with Q&A, um, but I'm briefly gonna bring in our fearless leader, the president of the MAP Center, Connie Chin, to say a few words about the exhibition um, and how you can support the MAP Center. So don't go anywhere, Maggie. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I sure can. So uh, bravo, bravo, Maggie and Garrett. Thanks for opening our eyes to how data can lead us to such different conclusions. It's such, it's amazing. I'm Connie Chin. I'm honored to serve as the president of the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And today, not only do we launch our live stream, but we open our exhibition and education initiative, Bending Lines, Deception and Distortion in Maps and Data. And I cannot tell you how excited we are um, to, bringing, to be bringing to you what we've been thinking about and preparing for over a year. Um, we appreciate so much that you joined us for this live stream. As Garrett mentioned, it will be archived available on the YouTube channel, so please send people to it. Um, and uh, this is a year-long initiative, so if you want to stay updated, please do sign up to our email list. I want to recognize the extraordinary work of the Leventhal Map and Education Center staff and our remarkable curator, Garrett Dash Nelson, um, as well as Michelle LeBlanc, Lynn Brown, Lloyd Kennedy, Bell Lipton, uh, Lauren Chen and Rachel Scherer and our incredible interns, Madison Bastras, Abby Duker, uh, Liz Kellum, Brian Komnick, Victoria Mock, Rachel Mead, and Corey Saramedis. And even though you are all watching from home, please give them a round of applause. Um, major funding from the Institute of Library and Museum Services has made this work possible, as well as the support of our partner, the Boston Public Library, our friends at Boston Mirror Maps, our board members, and other donors. And if you would like to make a donation to support us continuing to do this work, please uh, follow the link. Uh, it's on the banner. I think it's gonna show up in the chat uh, sooner or later. And, uh, or you can go to our website, leventhalmap.org and click the donate button. And I just wanna tell you in this day of analytics, the, the measure of our success is your response. And we'll be watching closely and gratefully for your support whether monetarily large or small. Thank you so much. Now, I imagine you all have lots of questions for 
Maggie and Garrett. So I'm going to turn it right back over to them. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. All right. I'm going to bring it back to you, Maggie. Before I do, I just want to say a couple of other things. Um, those of you who have been on the whole stream, you've heard me say this several times, but if you're just tuning in, make sure that you spend some time on the digital exhibition. The link is right there, and it's prominently on the front of our website. Again, it's not just a collection of maps. It's uh, interactives. It's Zoomable material. There's essays. Um, there's an education tour for K-12 students and educators. So if you're teaching from home, you can follow the education tour and uh, take the lesson plans that we used uh, to work with your kids. Um, and it's going to continue to grow and expand over the course of the year. We're thinking about it as something that will really evolve and change with material like this talk and these series, um, as well as workshops and activities that we'll be doing um, both before and after we're able to physically mount this exhibition in our gallery space. Uh, Maggie has started us off on such an amazing foot uh, with this Angles on Bending Lines series. Uh, we have three more weeks following this one at the same time. Each of our talks will be at 1, on, uh, 1 p.m. on Wednesdays, uh, also on Facebook Live and uh, YouTube Live. Uh, next week, we have Alastair Ray. Uh, to, he'll be joining us to talk about a chart he made of gerrymandered electoral districts in the United States and the uh, uses of geospatial data. On June 10th, Judith Tyner, who coined the term persuasive cartography in her doctoral dissertation, will be joining us from California. And on June 17th, the collector and writer PJ Mode, whose name is associated with persuasive cartography through his collection that now resides at Cornell University, uh, will be joining us to conclude the series. Uh, after that, we'll continue to be doing live events, activities, workshops, and teaching tours. Um, so keep an eye on us on our website and on social media. Now, I am going to start scrolling through this list of comments um, and pick some questions for Maggie. If you have questions for Maggie, please put them in the comments now. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, and if there are any that we don't get to, we'll try to circle back around to them uh, and answer them at a future date. So here's a question from Peter H. Vandemar. Can you read that, Maggie? I'll read it out to you. It says, are you familiar with Mark Mominier's book, How to Lie with Maps? Was that book used in developing the exhibition? I guess that's more of a question for, for me since we developed the exhibition, but do you know the book? I don't personally, but it sounds great. <laughs> it's a really interesting book. Actually, we we um, we were planning to pair uh, two uh, two pieces in the exhibition. Uh, we we um, show the column that Charles Blow wrote for the New York Times after the famous Sharpie Gate map, where President Trump um, took some creative liberties with the path of Hurricane Dorian. After that, Charles Blow wrote a, a, a op-ed for the Times called. Maps Don't Lie. And we were going to put Charles Blow's op-ed, Maps Don't Lie, right next to Mark Mominier's book, How to Lie with Maps, to open a question about do maps lie or don't they? Um, it's a great book. Uh, it's cited in the exhibitions. So you can link to it from there. It's a really, uh, it was one of the early uh, pieces of, of, of cartographic literature that, that kind of foregrounded this question. A lot of the, uh, the you know, uh, earlier work in academic cartography said you need to make accurate, you know, maps are accurate, maps are scientific instruments that you design with scientific principles in mind. And Mominier's work was one um, kind of uh, raised the question about, no, actually a lot of maps, whether intentionally or not intentionally, um, have a much more ambiguous relationship with the truth. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Here's a comment that uh, maybe you could uh, comment on, Maggie. Looking at this map for a place of cultural sensitivity and diversity and inclusion, there are other issues with the map that are a little more nuanced. I'm not quite sure since that came through the older comments. I don't know if that was referring to the map of New Orleans uh, or your map, but maybe you could say something about the role of uh, nuance and cultural sensitivity in your own work, Maggie. Yeah, I, you know, I just have to be honest that it's a fairly new um, avenue for me. I think uh, as I navigated through the different fields of like I said, biology, ecology, land protection, there are different ways of perceiving the world and conceiving of information. And uh, 
I think urban design and planning has led me to the most open-minded and uh, inclusive form of thinking. And so it's, it's still a journey to figure that out. And I'm uh, always open ear. And that's why I attended the Leventhal Center uh, speech. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I have a great answer other than right now, I'm trying to make sure that the data when it's created is as equitable as possible given the question at hand. Mm -hmm. And then the representation, I try to make it accessible to people with different disabilities, coloring, um, eyes, you know, different eyesight and uh, hearing. So the, the more nuanced questions about culture and other senses, I'm still working on that. But I'm open to re more recommendations. Keep the books coming and the news articles. Great. Here's another question for you, Maggie. This was fascinating. Where else can we see your work? Ah. That is very sweet. I, uh, well, parcel priority plan, check out the Boston uh, government website and take the survey if you're a Boston resident. And uh, you can see the latest survey results, but hopefully you'll be seeing more work from me through the, the, the city website. And, um, you know, personally, I love this kind of research. So yeah, you might see me in other forums as well, but nothing right now. Great. All right, another question. Thank you for this great talk and exhibit, genius work, very helpful and educational. Could we think of a middle ground map between the two maps showing sites of toxicity? Mm. I'm gonna bring your maps back up while, while you think about that, Maggie, so that um, if anybody's just joining us, they can see what we're talking about. Whoops. I don't know, but I love the challenge. <laughs> challenge taken. It's a great idea. And it kind of relates to what you were just saying about, you know, um, kind of having a provisional attitude towards map making, always uh, kind of reinforcing the fact that we're never going to have the perfect final map. It doesn't exist, even if we follow all the rules and we're as careful as possible about including as many voices. Any kind of map is going to have is going to leave something out. And so, you know, it's not only that there might be a middle ground between these two maps, but maybe there's a dozen other maps that that lead us to other stories about um, the relationship of toxic toxicity uh, to the population distribution of Massachusetts and different jurisdictions. So and being humble about wh where we can finalize our conclusions, introducing uncertainty uh, and openness into our maps and, and mitigating against like what you said before, this, this desire to look at data and think just, oh, well, that's, that's the answer that, that proves it. That's the end of the, that's the end of the story right there. Um, so maybe rather than a middle ground, maybe there are many, many other grounds, entirely alternative grounds that we could uh, take from the same data. And in fact, well, I don't think anybody else, uh, I know none, none of the other same data, different stories took quite your approach. Remember that we have five other same data, different stories uh, features uh, in the exhibition that all use the original data, that same set that we gave to Maggie um, and drew very different uh, interpretations from it. Uh, let's see. Do you find that when people are taught data mapping that normalization is stressed to the extent that thinking about the implications of count can be passed over? Is that a thing? Hmm. Huh. Well, um, I guess for my part, and then I, Garrett, this seems like something would be great to answer. Um, count is definitely the first thing that I learned uh, when I was learning GIS. Um, and I think Combining that with a sense, that is one way to learn uh, mapping and, and the way to use the programming. But these things always have to be combined with some other um, skill set. And so for me, I was coming from ecology background when I was learning GIS. And so the idea of the nuance of statistics and wildlife conservation, um, how to set, set up studies so that you accurately represent a situation or as best as possible, and how to you explain uh, the pitfalls. So, uh, you know, it, when I was learning GIS, count was the, the critical way to learn the skill set. But then I understood from my other training that, that there are some pitfalls there and they need to be accounted for. And then I was exploring those new visualizations. Yeah. yeah and I think maybe one, one thing to add is, you know, really thinking about what what does spatiality show us that we need a map to show? You know, sometimes you see these absurd maps of something like, you know, 
this map shows the number of E's in every town's name or something like that, that has nothing to do with, you know, it's not like as you move west, there's more E's in a town's name. I'm, just, I'm just obviously just making that up. But something like toxicity, before we even get to the map, we might want to think about what, you know, what's the relationship between where people live, how they're affected by toxic waste sites. That's, that is geographic in, in a certain sense in that you're closer to a toxic waste site, you're much more likely to be affected by it. If you're within the political boundaries of the same toxic waste site, then probably your, you know, your government agencies, your, whether it's your town or city or planning board has some role to play in mitigating that. Um, your taxes might go to support, um, you know, a cleanup effort. Um, but also, you know, if you are physically at risk the nearer that you are. So there is a spatiality to that in the way that some things that you see mapped really don't have a very strong spatial component at all. And maybe a map is not, in fact, the best way to show uh, data like that. And, you know, we talk about maps in the media. Oftentimes a map's just a kind of convenient device for a newspaper or, a, you know, cable news channel to show something on. And it doesn't actually tell us something. We didn't learn anything about the underlying uh, information or the phenomenon by seeing it on a map. It just happened to be a kind of convenient way to show it. And that's another thing that should should raise our skepticism. Uh, here's one more question. I'm going to take two more, I think. I wonder if you could speak to how you consider emotional and cultural associations with color, building upon the commentary around emphasis in the Corpleth visualization of Northern Ireland. So great question. If you go to the exhibition, you'll see all sorts of red on many of the maps. But maybe, Maggie, you could say something about color, uh, maybe even green being a, a, a yeah. employee of the parts department. I don't think I like green anymore. Uh, <laughs> green um, is is a tricky one. I, mean, I don't know if people are familiar with the term greenwashing, but sometimes just associating someone something with the color green, given our cultural association with that, can really make something seem hey environmentally friendly, great. And um, I purposely try to mess with color sometimes to get us out of the ruts of color association and but also understanding other colors like black. Black can often be the absence of information or something negative, but we also have terms like black ball, black male, uh, black sheep, and those do have uh, racist overtones and they perpetuate like color, uh, kind of pernicious ways of thinking. And so does green. And I think it's time to get more creative with our cartography and, um, using using color differently so definitely color can be powerful because we immediately you know some sometimes we want people to immediately pick out the the parks on a map but those same associations anywhere that we have an association can be useful and that it allows our minds to jump quickly to a conclusion but if it's a dangerous conclusion or a conclusion that reproduces assumptions like you said about race or power or who's on top and who's on bottom um, then it's something that we have to be more careful about. We're really, yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, just real quick. In some of the draft maps I created for this, I did try to pull upon some uh, kind of uh, television uh, branding colors mm -hmm. to, uh, to make people more comfortable with one map over the other. So yeah. Another example. Yeah, and your visual sense is, is just, it's so um, creative and so resonant, and which is one of the things I really like about, about your maps. So we're reaching the top of the hour. I'm gonna, there's one last uh, question here. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. We'll try to circle around. Uh, maybe we'll have Maggie answer some of these um, and attach them into the digital exhibition. Um, so for a last question, I love hearing planners talk about maps. They work to change the world with maps, not just to depict it. How do you think about the relationship between depicting accurately and proposing ethically? That is a beautiful question. And <laughs> yeah, I think um, when you are depicting the state of affairs, in some ways you're already uh, pointing towards the future. You already have a notion as to how you're gonna use that information. And so you're already shaping uh, what people can envision as possible. And so uh, often in planning, you depict the existing conditions and then you also show a map of proposed conditions. But in, in reality, both maps are talking about future conditions. And um, it's 
understanding at what point you're winnowing away information because you want people to be able to walk with you from existing conditions to the future. But you should provide a lot of background information in that existing conditions report and not um, unnecessarily curtail the conversation too early on and then have it be a, a collaborative process to get to that envisioning process where it makes sense that there's a lot less, maybe a lot less detail on the map in some ways. Uh, so that that's a good one. And, uh, you know, the New Orleans plan is another example of just kind of envisioning what's possible. And, and some people said, nope, don't see that future happening. <laughs> don't like that. So hopefully people can uh, feel comfortable speaking up when they don't agree with the proposed future. Yeah. We've got a, a, a triple, uh, a kind of triptych, three photos in the exhibition of people pointing at maps. And, you know, that figure of here's the map, here's what we're going to do is extremely powerful, as you know, as a planner, right? Pointing to the map can um, open possibilities and foreclose other possibilities. Uh, so working carefully with data and visualization that way does carry a real ethical responsibility. Maggie, it's been so great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope that we will be able to have you again to the MAP Center when we open. Um, I hope that many of you who have tuned in are able to come join us uh, at whatever future date we open this exhibition in person. But until then, you can visit Bending Lines from the comfort of your couch or your car or wherever else you read the internet uh, on a computer or a mobile phone at leventhalmap.org bending lines, where you can see Maggie's beautiful maps, as well as many others, modern and historical from the 16th century to the present that ask the question, how do we know what we know and how do maps shape that? Thanks for being here, Maggie. We'll see you later. Talk Thanks to you soon. For the rest of you, a reminder that we have a series of upcoming talks with guests like Maggie. Uh, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. for the next three weeks. Next week, we'll be welcoming Alastair Ray to talk about gerrymandering geospatial data. On June 10th, the coiner of the term persuasive cartography, Judith Tyner will join us here. And finally, on June 17th, PJ Mode, a collector uh, whose, uh, whose collection lives at the Cornell University Libraries online, collector persuasive cartography, will talk about deceptive map making. I'm Garrett Nelson. We are the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. It's great to have you all here. We'll see you next week.